good evening ladies and gentlemen this is sakib pathan uh, president philan club of india uh, a warm welcome from uh, the philan club of india now today we are doing this uh, beautiful event on uh, chronic diarrhea in association with uh, zoetis um, zoetis has always been on board with us and um, they have uh, they have always shown their faith and support in the journey of educating the cat owners and the masses so today uh, there is one more um uh, seminar you know in 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 this uh, weekly webinars that we do um, and we have a special guest uh, before talking about the guest uh, it's let us talk about the topic which is chronic diarrhea hum mein se kitni baar hamare paas ye ye cheeze aati hai ke hamare catering mein ek cat aisi hai ke jiska diarrhea hi theek nahi hota hai okay ke kuch bhi kar lo kitna bhi kuch bhi kar lo uska loose motions khatam nahi hota okay Uh, whatever food you change uh, whatever things you do you cha- you do you do things uh, differently um, you know unko alag se rakhe quarantine kare but unka wo jo loose motion hota hai wo jo loose potty hoti hai jo jelly kind of thing hota hai wo theek nahi hoti hai aur um, kai baar hum kafi zyada concern hote hain ye sab cheezon ko lekar ke ye uh, specifically ye cat ke bare mein kyu ho raha hai and uh, hum log sab to sahi kar rahe hain is cat ke sath mein but ye kyu um, uh, problem is specific cat ke liye aa raha hai So, इसके लिए अगर हम रूट्स में जाए तो बहुत इन डेप्थ साइंस है कुछ मैनेजमेंट रिलेटेड इश्यूज है कुछ डिसीज रिलेटेड इश्यूज है और uh, ये चीज के ऊपर थोड़ा सा लाइट डालने के लिए और यू नो इन डेप्थ एक्सप्लेन करने के लिए हमारे पास में वी हैव अ गेस्ट स्पेशल गेस्ट टुडे वी हैव डॉक्टर कुणाल देव शर्मा सो कुणाल देव शर्मा जो कि दिल्ली के नहीं बट हिंदुस्तान के काफी नामचीन डॉक्टर है and uh, he runs an uh, hospital in multiple cities by the name of uh, max vets so talking about kunal dev sharma uh, he is uh, he completed his bbsc and ah uh, from haryana agriculture university hisar um, his love for horses led him to train in equines at the hyderabad turf club after which he worked in southeast asia for a few years at multiple specialty mixed animal practice following this he diversified going on to pursue ophthalmology as a specific form in australia he is also one of the few indians uh, indian veterinarians to have earned a prestigious membership to the royal college of veterinary surgeon united kingdom uh, kunal dev sharma returned to india in 2011 after working in england for a couple of years and the interest in orthopedics was inculcated in the year 2009 when he worked in the ortho- uh, orthopedic referral hospital in united kingdom and since then he has trained intensively uh, in spine surgeries and trauma surgeries today he is an active member and trainer uh, of international veterinary orthopedics community member of ao vet and european society of veterinary ophthalmology and traumatology um, and i would widely request all our participants who are watching us live to post your questions you know after uh, the session gets over um what we'll try to do is um we'll take your questions one by one uh, hum try karo ke you keep the questions um close to the relevant topic which is chronic diarrhea anything and everything related to this question, uh, this topic it would be um we will we'll try because you know there are hundreds of questions that come up we'll try and get you uh, get your questions answered and um, also we would uh, ask uh, dr kunal dev sharma if he could not answer any sort of questions um that you know he can write back to you or maybe you can have his contact details and we can get your questions answered so we are just waiting for uh, dr kunal to join in um and guys you can uh, start posting your comments or your questions uh in regards to this 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 particular topic um we'll we'll just see uh, if uh, dr kunal has joined and get back to you shortly please stay tuned you know i'll be back in a, in a second sorry for the technical glitch uh, dr kunal is joining us in a minute uh, by then 
you know we are getting all, already we are getting comments and questions on um, the chat boxes also we are live on youtube so you know you can you can watch this session from there um, also if there are some good experiences that you got which help you in understanding the situation you can also write your experiences in the comment box uh, we we are just waiting for uh, dr sharma to join in our kuchi seconds mein he'll be there with us and we will get the topic and you know start the discussion from there because um, as a, as a, as a cat owner and you know uh, somebody who has kept cats all my life i know ki ye topic kitna important hai aur wo ek um um a cat aap aapko uh, agar uski uski potty theek na ho to aapko psychologically mentally disturb kar sakti hai and you are always in concern that you know what is wrong with your cat you know so uh, and 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 uh, diagnostics karna kafi mushkil ho jata hai diagnosis karna bahut mushkil ho jata hai aise situation ke andar because um i always say you know hats off to our uh, veterinarians you know because um feline treatment is considered to be the most challenging uh, treatment uh, across the globe you know across the animal kingdom because hamari uh, cats um apne apne um pain aur apne bimariyon ko hide karne ke लिए जानी जाती है ये एक एवोल्यूशनरी साइकोलॉजी है जो उनको वाइल्ड में सर्वाइव करने के लिए काम में आती है बट इसे बहुत ज्यादा दिक्कत हो जाती है हमें समझने के लिए कि आपके कैट के साथ में कुछ गलत हो रहा है एंड इवन टू द वेटेनरियंस के उनको ट्रीट करना पहले ये एक 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 बेजुबान जानवर है जो बोल नहीं सकता है और एंड सेकेंड थिंग इज इट इज हाइडिंग इट्स पेन हाइडिंग इट्स प्रॉब्लम यू नो सो इट बिकम्स वेरी टफ सो ऑलवेज यू नो आई एम ग्रेटफुल टू ऑल दैट्स एंड यू नो हैट्स ऑफ टू दम that they are doing such a difficult job of understanding and treating our cats okay so that's something that we would like to discuss today i'll just check whether dr kunal has joined just give me a second we are already getting questions and there are so many relevant questions that are coming in um, i think uh, we'll wait for the session to start uh, because most of the questions are expert covered in our sessions but um, you know anything which is left or something which is of concern that you know we should uh, revisit on this topic i'm sure that uh, we would try and take those questions uh, again at the end of the session guys just please bear with us for a second you know dr kunal is just joining in there is some technical um, issue and that's something you know happens online i always say that this online webinars and uh, online sessions are always challenging as compared to the physical sessions because you know there is techno technology involved when we are in the fit, uh, physical sit, uh, situation we are in the same room and um, whatever go, go goes wrong we can take care and we are just waiting for him to join just please please uh, bear with us for a uh, few seconds
yeah, finally the thing seems to be resolved and uh, uh, Dr. Kunal is joining in shortly. Uh, I'm sure we are very excited to know about this chronic diarrhea and uh, I'm so sorry about the technical glitch that has happened. He should be here in any moment. I am seeing a lot of cat owners already uh, putting their questions and queries and doubts in the comment section. Uh, please feel free to ask anything related to the topic. We would try and answer as many questions as possible by the end of the session. Dr. Kunal, good evening. Hi, good evening. Good evening, Saqib. I'm so sorry for joining in late. I'm sorry to all the listeners and uh, audience as of now. Uh, there was a little delay from my end. Not an I issue, sir. Great things take time. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, we just finished with uh, your introduction and uh, okay. uh, there are already people uh, starting to post comments. So Fantastic. I was, you know, and, and this is something which is a, uh, a what what you can say it's it's like a, a tedious task for uh, cat owners when you have diarrhea prolonged diarrhea you know what we call about chronic, right. uh, chronic diarrhea and you don't get right. into the roots of it and they are so frustrated because it's very frustrating they would like i have done everything every sort of medication every sort of probiotics um Correct. gone to n number of uh, vets but still i'm not getting you know the the the, the potty light you know the condition it's it's still loose so what would you say, sir? I, I'm sure you would be getting so many um, uh, uh, cats of this sort or uh, cat owners who have this problem. So surprisingly, you know, the maximum OPD that any practice sees is either gastrointestinal dis disorders or skin disorders. Right okay. now, gastrointestinal disorders, we'll speak about this uh, in the next you know, few minutes. We'll start talking about uh, vomits and diarrhea, which is one of the most common causes for also severe dehydration and eventual death of the patient. Okay. So if if we are able to uh, uh, tackle this in the early stages, we can save the life. And sometimes it's so contagious and infectious then one, that one after another, it's a chain reaction. You have one kitten who develops it, the second kitten, third kitten, and by the time you know you are able to diagnose something, uh, you've already lost a substantial number of lives. So uh, I think I think let's start the lecture. I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions in between. And I'm, I think uh, we'll be open to the questions that one can post in the chat box and we will, we will answer them one by one. I would also say that in between, we can also stop at a slide. So if uh, kindly direct me because I'll be looking at my presentation only, but if right. in case there are some questions based on a particular slide, so we can stop there and we can answer those queries and move forward. Sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Because you know, that would be great. The people have already started posting the comments and uh, why I'm not taking those questions now is because uh, most of the times our experts cover in their uh, topic, you know, in their presentation. Right. So right. if something which is left or something which is, you know, something which has to be revisited, given more importance to, we'll take those questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'll do that. Uh, so uh, the topic for today, as everyone knows, is chronic diarrhea. I'm going to cover a little bit of acute diarrhea as well because anything which becomes chronic starts from being acute and uh, like i said when it becomes chronic it becomes tougher to tackle it so it's easier and better if you are able to tackle it right at the stage when it's acute right sir. so uh, sh let me share my screen and let's get started Yeah, so you can just put it on full screen. Uh, no, you yeah. were there. The, the screen was there already. I hope this is visible. Yeah, this is visible. And uh, um, yeah, you can put it on full screen. Yeah. That's great, sir. Over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, feel free to ask questions. 
um, and uh, we would try and cover as many questions as we can. Uh, Dr. Kunal Sharma, over to you. We are waiting to hear everything about chronic diarrhea. Thank you, Sakib. Welcome to a session on chronic diarrhea in felines. It's one of the very common things that I'm sure everyone experiences and comes across. So I'm going to straight jump to what is diarrhea. So diarrhea is unformed or loose bowel movements. It's stools which are unformed or loose, usually with increased amount and frequency. So the intensity and the frequency and the amount, the volume of stools increases. So it is not necessary that the stools become loose. Sometimes the volume increases, the frequency increases, they might be okay formed, they might be well formed. Still that is considered and classified as diarrhea. It is a result of faster movement of fecal material through the intestines combined with decreased absorption of water, nutrients and electrolytes. Let's interpret this statement a little bit. So when we say that it is a result of faster movement of fecal material, that means that the stomach, the gut motility, the intestinal motility is stronger. It is more than usual. It is more than what it should be. As a result, what happens is, as a result, you have uh, diarrhea, which is of either more volume, more frequency or also loose. It becomes loose when there is decreased absorption of water also nutrients also electrolytes so we are lead diarrhea is leading to electrolyte imbalance it is leading to electrolyte loss it is leading to nutrient loss so the patient is gradually and gradually becoming more and more weaker and dehydrated right so as the patient is becoming more and more dehydrated we are trying to uh, we are trying to control the uh, dehydration levels and uh, trying to increase the hydration level. At the same time, it is important to also take care of the nutritional um, nutritional value which is going through food or water or IV fluids. Also the electrolyte loss. So the diarrhea is also classified as lack of absorption of the fluids. Thereby what happens is there is more fluid coming out from the backside. Or a secretory diarrhea where a certain portion of the intestines starts secreting more water from the body, thereby dehydrating the body into the intestine, right? So what is happening here is that the patient is having loose tools, losing water, losing nutrients, losing electrolytes. Now, diarrhea is not a disease in itself. It is a result of something. So it is a sign of many different diseases, right? So understand that diarrhea itself is not a diagnosis ever. But diarrhea, why that happened? That is important to know. So we, we should try and figure out why is diarrhea there. All right. So it is a it is not a disease. It is a sign of many other diseases. There is a little diagram uh, underneath and this particular laptop that I'm using, I can't really zoom in. I don't know how much is visible, but basically what uh, what it's showing is, is, uh, is the digestive system. So the digestive system stra start from the mouth, ends at the rectum. So anything which is consumed orally goes through the food pipe, through the esophagus, into the stomach, and from stomach, then there are there are coiled intestines. So then there is duodenum, then there is duodenum, jejunum, and then you know the large intestinal portion starts. Then you have the um, uh, ileum, and then the small cecum and the colon. Colon is the last portion of the intestine where it connects to the anus, to the rectum, right? So we will discuss in the next few slides about how do we classify stools so when you're speaking to the uh, to your client or uh, if you're not a veterinarian and if you are the client and if you are a cat owner and if you're speaking to your veterinarian on the phone or having an online consult it is it will be easier for your veterinarian or as a veterinarian if you ask certain questions it will be easier for you to diagnose the problem much quicker so we have to ask basic questions which is is there any vomit is if there is a vomit is it more like a regurgitation or is it more like a, uh, a reflux acid reflux or is it an actual active vomit where the where the stomach is contracting and the and the you know ingesta which is in the stomach is coming out then how are the stools what is the frequency of stools what is the volume of stools and what is the consistency of the stools so 
it's uh, this is this is a chart which I thought that if I was uh, using my iPad, I would have zoomed in. I I know you can't uh, see much, but if you Google up these uh, charts, they are uh, they are readily available on Google, and uh, not very pleasant pictures, pretty nasty pictures. But basically, we are trying to classify the diarrhea into three different textures. We say very moist, but has a distinct shape. It presents as piles rather than distinct logs. So it is it is one whole thing. It's not it's not giving you uh, different tards of you know poop which comes out, which you can easily remove uh, from the litter, right? So it is very moist. It is it has a shape, but it's not present as piles rather than distinct logs. It is not present as that. So it is one pile which is like a paste. So that's one classification. Another classification of diarrhea is when it gets worse, it goes to the next stage where it has texture. It has texture, so it is not completely watery or fluidy, but it has no defined shape. It is not present as piles or spots. It is just a paste mixed with, say, a lot more fluid, right? The third one is watery, which has no texture, and it is just puddle, right? Now, along with this, you must also note if there are any visible worms, if there are any visible blood, if the color is black or green or yellow or gray, because that will give certain kinds of information. For example, gray pieces comes when there is a liver disturbance, black pieces when there is a small intestinal bleeding, red pieces when there is a large intestinal bleeding, mucus when there is a colitis or when the mucus, mucus comes from the last portion of the large intestine. So these, these, this information, just this gross information from, from the eyes will give you a lot of information about what kind of a diarrhea it is. And it will be very, very helpful in actually treating it. Now, diarrhea or enteritis, which is inflammation of the intestines or gastroenteritis, which is the inflammation of stomach and the intestines can be caused due to infectious agents or non-infectious agents. So in infectious agents, primarily we will have bacteria, viruses, worms, coccidia, and then we have non-infectious irritants. What will be the non-infectious irritants? They will be the chemical toxins, poisons, plants, and some of, some of the more common causes of inflammation uh, they, they, they will be the more common causes of inflammation. So tox like poisonous plants. So lily flowers, lily flowers, as a lot of you might know, are highly toxic to uh, cats and they lead to different kinds of signs. But sometimes the first sign that you actually see is pasty stools. Then it becomes hypermotility of the stomach. Then it becomes even worse and it gets, you know, uh, get even uh, it gets converted into bloody stools, then neurological signs. So those are things which gradually keep on building up and the moment they keep on building up, it is, it, it, it's making the gastroenteritis even worse, right? Now, uh, besides this, uh, there is a picture underneath. There is, this is just a picture which is showing you, you know, what the intestines, the inside of the intestine, which is the mucosa, um, uh, it looks like internally histopathologically or under the microscope under magnification so a healthy gut just like a healthy skin is of a certain color what happens when there is an injury we say that there is inflammation there is swelling when we say there is inflammation so medically we term it as itis in the end enteritis right so when we say anything ending with the tis it becomes the inflammation it's indicating the inflammation what happens in the inflammation is swelling. Now this swelling attracts a lot of different kinds of cells in the body, which is a different thing altogether. That's the pathophysiology. But basically enteritis, gastroenteritis, it is causing swelling inside the intestines and the stomach, which is leading to uh, increased motility, which is in leading to increased bacterial count, which is leading to uh, bleeding sometimes. If the inflammation is more than a certain amount, then it will cause these small little capillaries to burst, thereby they cause addition of blood into the intestine. Right. So 
so now slowly we will go on to uh, a little differentiation of chronic diarrhea versus acute diarrhea but what is chronic diarrhea the topic that we have today chronic diarrhea chronic diarrhea that has been persistent for more than two to three weeks it becomes very difficult to diagnose and treat effectively even extensive workup does not always provide a definitive answer to the problem however in most cases a thorough clinical workup including food trials can result in a successful manage of, management of the diarrhea so like a, like uh, you know we were discussing before the start of the lecture also that acute versus chronic acute diarrhea or anything in the acute state for that matter is easy to treat the moment it becomes chronic there is a whole lot of pathology which comes around it and it becomes tougher and difficult to diagnose and treat then sometimes in in a lot of cases we are unable to have a cure but in a lot of cases we are have able to have a palliative or a management uh, our aim of the therapy becomes managing the condition rather than curing the condition because sometimes you just can't cure it we will we will go on to how to uh, cure the condition and how to manage the condition in the next few slides so another classification that we must ask ourselves as veterinarians as uh, breeders as cat owners is is the diarrhea acute or chronic that's the first question when did it start how did it start what what did the cat eat was there a change in the environment was there a change in the food was there a disease process which was going on in the cat or was the cat under treatment for something else so acute versus chronic the next is is it intra or extra intestinal i will explain what that means intra intestinal means anything which is happening inside the lumen of the intestine extra intestinal is anything which is happening outside the lumen of the intestine it could be it could be a viral disease it could be a, a tumor it could be a cancer it could be anything which is outside the intestine which is leading to diarrhea so your diarrhea is a symptom of something else which is going on outside the intestines itself also how severely are the intestines affected now the consistency of the stool the volume of the stool how chronic or acute it is will all help you in diagnosing how severely the intestines are affected there are certain tests also which we will be discussing in the next few slides like clonoscopy endoscopy gastroscopy duodenoscopy which is basically shoving a camera inside which is putting a camera inside and we we've just recently introduced something called a capsule endoscopy capsule endoscopy is very interesting and so far we've just performed it on two dogs actually not on cats but it can be done on cats also it's a capsule which is uh, given orally and the capsule has multiple cameras and it goes as it goes through the stomach and the different portions of intestine it's capturing multiple images and then it is eventually thrown out of the system in the poop when it comes out uh, there is uh, that that's eliminated from the body but it provides a lot of information and on 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 through certain leads you can have multiple uh, diagnostic information of different parts of the intestine and the stomach through that also differentiating between small and large bowel diarrhea is also very very important which means whether the diarrhea is small intestinal or large intestinal small bowel diarrhea which is more common in cats tends to be subtle and smoldering it typically features large volume so when we are saying whether the volume is large or slow uh, large or less why what information is it providing this is the information small intestinal diarrhea is typically in large volume so large volume of stools will be passed low frequency it's not that the cat will be going every two hours into the litter box or will, will be having a lot of accidents outside the litter box but so the frequency will be less maybe you know two times a day maybe three times a day or maybe even just once a day but the volume will be more there will be marked chronicity typically in small bowel diarrhea which is that it would be going on for a longer time when you start looking at the um, you know when you start going into the history you realize that you know it's been going on for a long time it is generally associated with weight loss and lack of straining sometimes mucus or even blood generally the blood would be black in color and not bright bright red because it's coming from the small intestines so if you have a cat who's constantly losing weight but otherwise the cat is active there is a lot of information that actually you can get from its stool so a stool test would be critical and 
important. Also, you need to go back and check the cat letter very often. As a veterinarian, you must ask your client these questions and ask them to get your sample of the stool so that you can check in your lab. The, going on to large bowel diarrhea, which is a large intestinal diarrhea, that is more common in dogs, uh, having uh, said that it's more common in dogs than in cats, but we do see that in cats as well. And generally, I personally see them with dietary insufficiency or indiscretion, where the diet is causing a diarrhea, then it's generally in cats in particular, it is a large bowel diarrhea. So it is, it is more dramatic, in fact, because it is generally acute and characterized by frequent trips to the litter box. There's tenesmus, which is training. There's blood. It, it, the blood is generally red, or you might see streaks of blood. There is mucus in the stools. And, you know, these uh, uh, this, this diarrhea sometimes is mixed in nature, which means there is some portion of the watery stool. There is some portion of the pasty stool. Sometimes it's water with some form stools. So here, the first thing that, that would come to my mind would be, Change the, change the diet and see. Go back and see if the diet has been changed. Or if it's not been changed, then maybe this diet has become allergic or not suiting the cat anymore. Right? Now, like we had briefly discussed that what are the main causes? So we said bacteria, virus, protozoans, ailments, cystodes, and you know, giardia and those things. So what are the main bacteria that generally we see? Why is this important? Now, you would say that, you know, we give an antibiotic, it covers, generally we give a broad spectrum antibiotic, it covers most of the bacteria. Well, if the antibiotic is not needed, then giving an antibiotic is only causing resistance and it is only causing more damage to, damage to the body. So, if it's not a bacterial diarrhea, then there is no point giving it. Also, you can use a narrow spectrum uh, antibiotic, not a broad spectrum strong antibiotic, if you know what, which bacteria is causing the problem. Right. So generally what we have done uh, uh, in our stool cultures and generally what we find is Salmonella, Compilobacter and Clostridium. Seldom we've seen Helicobacter, but Helicobacter infections, we generally have to take a sample from the stomach. So we have to do an endoscopy and then take the sample. So there are different kinds of antibiotics which act on these different kinds of bacteria. But what bacteria does is it causes a bacterial overgrowth syndrome bacterial peritonitis, bacterial cholangiohepatitis. Basically, this increased bacteria, this increased bad bacteria in the guts will lead to hypermotility, which is increased uh, peristaltic movements of the intestines, and thereby it leads to diarrhea. It also causes secretory diarrhea. It also, also causes a lot of inflammation, thereby sometimes it causes also bleeding inside the intestine because the inflammation, the capillaries burst sometimes. The most common viral, uh, viral uh, primary viral agents that cause diarrhea, you would see that in feline coronavirus. We, I remember we had a lecture on feline, uh, F FIP and feline coronavirus, feline enteric coronavirus, uh, I think about a month, month and a half back. So if you remember anything from, from then, so feline coronavirus causes feline in, enteric disease. And later on, this feline enteric coronavirus gets converted to, it can get tweaked or mutated into a FIP disease, feline infectious peritonitis, which also will have gastrointestinal signs if it is hitting onto the gastrointestinal tract. Then feline leukemia virus, feline immunodeficiency virus, which is FIV and FELV. And the most common, which you would see in unvaccinated cats and kittens would be feline panleukopenia virus, which is the feline parvovirus also. Hey, this is a very, very deadly disease and it's very commonly seen. I vaguely remember that we've also discussed this in one of the lectures, I think, on infectious diseases once uh, we have. But we'll briefly speak about these anyways. I'm just going to come back to these two uh, viruses because these two are very commonly seen viruses. So I'm going to speak a little more about that. But very quickly going on to the primary helminths would be the ankylostoma and the strongloid and the toxocera. Uh, and then the protozoans, which is Giardia generally, or the Cryptospora, or the Cryptosporidium, Entamoebia, and the Trichomonas. Then there are certain kinds of cystodes and certain kinds of worms, Echinococcus, and the Tinea species, and Diclidium species, which causes subclinical infections, which can increase and can go on to a very strong infection. Remember, going back to the earlier lecture, which was about a month and a half back, feline enteric coronavirus, 
is related to FIP producing strains of coronavirus and invades the enterocytes, which are the cells, which are the cells of the intestine at the tips of the villi. You remember we, I just showed you a picture. I'm going to go back very quickly because I want to show you that picture again. So we, what you see on your screen below are the villi. These are the intestinal villi. Now inflammation of these villi, the infection and inflammation of these villi causes enteritis. All right. So we are looking at, uh, we are looking at inflammation and we are looking at infection of the villi, which feline enteric coronavirus causes. Infected cats become can become asymptomatic and develop a mild transient diarrhea and fever. Fever, fever comes, diarrhea comes, next day they are fine. You also forget about it that maybe it was indigestion without realizing it might have been about a feline enteric coronavirus, which will lead to a bigger disease later on, which is FIP. Almost 10% of these cats who've been exposed will develop the disease FIP. So, but uh, having said that, it's important to get the testing done the moment you have diarrhea. So they, we'll talk about what tests in the next few slides. Feline panleukopenia uh, is characterized by, uh, the feline panleukopenia is very common. I'm sure all of you as veterinarians, as breeders, as cat owners have heard or seen this sometime when there is vomit, there is diarrhea, there is a very emaciated losing condition of the, of the body. It causes fever, depression, anorexia. The cat does not want to eat. And of course, vomits and diarrhea is there, sometimes with blood. Historically, feline panleukopenia was caused exclusively by pan, feline panleukopenia virus. However, now it has been confirmed that feline panleukopenia can be caused by canine parvovirus also. There are two varieties, CPV canine parvovirus 2A and 2B, which can also cause feline panleukopenia. Feline panleukopenia has become an uncommon disease in certain parts of the world, but in our country, it is still a very, very common disease because of lack of protein vaccinations. However, outbreaks, in, at least in our practice, we do see a lot of outbreaks. And occasionally, we see this in uh, vaccinated animals also because there is, there, is a, there is a chance of vaccination failure. We do see a lot of feral population and uh, we do see some breeders who bring in their cats. A lot of uh, breeders do um, overpopulate uh, population in their catteries and then these outbreaks are more common. The clinical signs are similar to those described for dogs with parvovirus enteritis. So if you are more, uh, uh, if you've dealt more with the canine parvovirus, then the feline parvovirus, pa feline panleukopenia virus also causes similar kind of, uh, similar kind of uh, signs and symptoms. Diagnosis is based on history, physical examination and findings and then in the CBC, in the hemogram, you will see neutropenia. Neutro neutrophils will crash. They will go down. The TLC count, the total leukocyte count, or the white blood cell count goes down. You can also run a fecal ELISA. You can also do a fecal ELISA, which is a snap test, which is a very quick five-minute test. There is also PCR test available, and the PCR test is very, very sensitive. The only thing is the PCR, there's a turnaround time of about 24 hours, which is very critical for the patient. So I generally suggest that you do a CBC in-house. You do the SNAP test because it's just a kit, five-minute test kit. Do that and start the treatment immediately. You take a sample, send it for PCR. If your ELISA test result or if your CBC is not indicating FPV, then you send the sample for the PCR. But don't waste time because one day, the turnaround time of one to two days, 24 to 48 hours is highly critical. The treatment is generally supportive. We will talk different, you know, again about the treatment, but the treatment is generally supportive and the treatment is very similar to most of most of the other uh, gastroenteritis uh, treatments that we have. So we will go on to the diagnostic steps. Now, how do we diagnose? Before anything else, a fecal test should be run to rule out parasites. So the first thing that you do, your cat has diarrhea, your kitten has diarrhea, whether you have cat V or if you're a veterinarian, you, got, uh, you have a cat, in your clinic on your uh, on your examination table check for parasites check the vaccination history check the deworming history take a small little uh, fecal sample and check for parasites there are different tests that we can do for the uh, for the feces and i will explain that in my next slide but before uh, before that we'll just quickly run through what are the steps that we generally follow in maxweights in my practice so uh, large bowel diarrhea signals intestinal parasites in cats, like I said, particularly in kittens. 
and typically caused by roundworms, hookworms, and coccidia. There are false negatives possible as ova are shed intermittently. So not in every fecal sample uh, uh, you will see the ova or you will see the worms. And if you don't see the worms, that does not mean that there is 100% no, uh, no worms in the tummy. If it's a kitten, there is poor history of deworming. And if it looks like a large bowel diarrhea, large intestinal diarrhea, which means high volume diarrhea, consider using a broad spectrum dewormer, always. The next step after the fecal test, after the stool test, is to run some routine blood works. Now, routine blood works is one prick, you're taking out the blood sample, and you want to rule out a few things. So, routine blood works to detect underlying causes of diarrhea might be pointing to pancreatitis, which is got low sensitivity to amylase and lipase, but there is a there is a beautiful test available these days, which is FPL, feline pancreatic lipase, and, which is a specific test. And it is one of the most simplest tests that we can do. It is easily available these days in India. Uh, there are two companies that I'm aware of, which, which are providing this. One is IDES, the other one is WeCheck. Uh, we use both, we have both the machines. And I don't see a uh, contrasting difference between the two machines. I think both of them are giving decent results. Uh, there is a uh, there are more sensitive tests for pancreatitis which are unfortunately not available in our country but fpl is one such thing you have to rule out liver disease or nephropathy so a liver function test or a kidney function test through that blood blood works when you're running the blood works is important in older cats also the ones which have a concurrent weight loss a t4 thyroxin test must be done to check for hyperthyroidism. Typically, cats, unlike dogs, will have hyperthyroidism, not hypothyroidism. So, also physical exam in the physical examination, as you're going down the trachea towards the ventral neck, you might palpate a swelling. It can be unilateral, which is one-sided, or bilateral, which is both-sided. So, this is where the thyroid gland is, and this is uh, it, it's important to uh, palpate it in a general physical examination. If there is any swelling that you note there get the cat check for uh, thyroid levels. And if it's hyperthyroidism, then there is treatment available for it. If diarrhea is acute or severe, so based on that, you have, uh, based on you know whether it's acute or it's severe or it's chronic, there are certain things that you will conclude. Abdominal ultrasonography is important. I like to perform abdominal ultrasonography after taking an uh, X-ray because X-ray gives me certain kinds of information and then we do an ultrasound. As we're doing the ultrasound, it should be, I prefer it on a full bladder first, and then we remove the urine. We uh, manually express the bladder, we remove the urine, and then we again to perform the ultrasound because the bladder might interfere with some diagnostic uh, indicators. Uh, abdominal ultrasonography can be used to evaluate the five layers of intestine. So there is lumen, which is the innermost layer. So this it's a hollow thing, you know, the intestines is hollow. Is, they are hollow. So the lumen, then there is mucosa. Mucosa is the innermost layer. Then there is submucosa, which is above the mucosal layer as we're going outwards from the lumen going outwards. So mucosa, submucosa, then there is muscularis. Muscularis layer is the one which is responsible for uh, peristaltic movements. And then the topmost layer is the protective layer called the serosa. You can also in your ultrasound look for mesenteric lymph nodes if the lymph nodes are swollen, if they are normal. You can also check pancreas if the pancreas are inflamed or if there is a tumor there or if there is any, any pathology going there. Also, you can look at the gallbladder and the gallbladder can be tracked down and you can look at the gall, uh, common bile duct. Now, what we are looking at, the first two pictures on the top are the x-rays whenever you are taking the x-rays of the abdomen or for that matter any other part of the body the x-rays must be there must be two x-rays you must always always take orthogonal views which are two x-rays at a 90 degree view see x-ray is a two-dimensional figure two-dimensional figure is only giving you limited information unless you are also taking another view which is at 90 degree so as veterinarians always take orthogonal views always take two views so that you have more information one x-ray can be misleading one single view can be misleading those of you who are who are breeders or who are cat owners insist at your veterinarian to take two views two 90 degree views because you might miss out something on a single view and also you might misdiagnose something or your veterinarian might misdiagnose something on a single view 
the below two pictures are those of intestines again these are two different views so you have the transverse and the longitudinal view there are two different views in the of of the ultrasound also because this also provides you different kinds of information and what we are seeing on the on the on the picture is inflammation we are seeing enteritis we are seeing fluid filled loops of intestines and they are inflamed now we spoke about diagnostic procedures of the feces of the stools we said that you know the stools are very important and it's very very important to check them so there are different techniques which can be done direct smear stain smear fecal flotation culture immunological techniques electron microscopy or a simple microscopy for that matter and then endoscopy or exploratory laparotomy endoscopy is putting a camera through the whichever orifice you put it from that's how it's called so if you put it from the rectum it's called clonoscopy if you put it through the mouth it's called esophage esophagoscopy if it goes on only to the esophagus which is the food pipe if it enters the stomach it's called gastroscopy the moment you cross the pylorus and enter the small intestine which is the duodenum it's called duodenoscopy now direct smear i'm going to briefly tell you very quickly what direct smear means fresh so fresh diarrhea samples should be microscopically examined immediately for the presence of motile protozoal trophocytes including those of giardia or the trichomonas fetus the amount of feces required to cover the head of the match is mixed thoroughly with one drop of normal saline 0.9% normal saline one drop thoroughly it's thoroughly mixed and then there is just a drop of it used on the slide and a cover slip put on top of it and then you check under 100x uh, 100x uh, 100 times magnification which is 100x magnification so very simple very quick just a 2 minute job the stain smear takes about 30 to 45 minutes depending on what kind of uh, uh, staining you are using but just like the blood smear is done for blood protozoal infection or to count the platelets or to do a manual count of various different differential leukocyte count so a, just like a blood smear is made similarly a thin smear of feces is made and when there is a, a diarrhea happening in multiple uh, in a cattery with multiple cats all cats you must make a thin smear of feces from all cats not just one a cotton swab is generally gen, gen, you know introduced so cotton swab can be your ear bud also it is generally just introduced 3 to 4 cm through the anus into the terminal rectum directed onto the wall of the rectum and gently rotated several times so you put it in to the rectum you rotate it a few times take it out and that's your uh, that's your swab now put a drop of 0.9% normal saline on this cotton swab and then you know you shove it in, into the rectum take it out roll this on the slide when you take out the ear bud or the cotton swab roll it onto a slide to give areas with varying smear thickness so some at some place it might be thin at some place it might be Thick, air dry, stain, and then check. You can check for Campylobacter, Clostridium. You can check. Uh, you can use, and there are different kinds of stains available. So staining can be with uh, Jamsa stain, or there is Diffquick available uh, from abroad. You can also make your own Diffquick. If you speak to a pathologist, they'll tell you how to make it. It's a 10-minute technique. It's a very quick one. Then fecal flotation, which uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of uh, veterinarians are doing this. Fecal flotation method. Fecal flotation is. Uh, um very simple thing to do very quick thing to do you can also send the sample out for culture to see what kind of a bacteria is there or sometimes very rarely we see fungus but we do see fungal enteritis also but generally a bacterial culture will give you what kind of a bacteria is it is it salmonella or is it something else based on the culture results sensitivity results you can select an antibiotic there are immunological immunological techniques available a lot elisa is available for number of number of organisms um for uh, like we said panleukopenia or even giardia uh, there are uh, elisa tests available generally these are uh, you know snap tests so these are very quick 5 minute tests then microscopy electron microscopy is with an electron microscope which is uh, to uh, to diagnose and detect viral particles in feces of cats with gastrointestinal signs of disease so approximately you need 1 to 3 grams of feces and If you don't have an electron microscope, you can consider sending this out um, to a to a to a nice lab. Endoscopy is like I have already explained. With endoscopy, you can also do gastric biopsies, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, that Helicobacter infections we use as ezithromycin, which is 
generally not used for uh, gastrointestinal dis disorders. But if it's a helicobacter infection, we end up using an azithromycin antibiotic. So the histopathology, the biopsy gives us a lot of information. In chronic diarrhea patients, generally we do a, uh, we do multiple biopsies. In fact, we do a gastric biopsy, we do a duodeno biopsy, we also do a clone uh, from the colon. We take a little sample. Exploratory laparotomy is a surgical process. There are two ways of doing so. Um, we do it both ways in our practice. We put a through the navel, we put a camera inside, we inflate the abdominal cavity, and then there is a 2.7 mm or a 4 mm camera, depending on the size of the cap, which goes in and then we explore with a probe, we explore different parts of the intestines. And if we feel that there is a lymph node which is increased, or if there is a foreign body inside, or if there is any pathology, so we take a sample of it. Alternatively, the conventional method is to make an incision, open the abdomen, and look, visualize what is wrong inside. The, uh, there are, these are some pictures of, you know, inside uh, of the abdomen through the camera that has have been clicked. And uh, the third picture that you see, the bottom right, is normalish, normal mucosa of the stomach. That is normal. What you see on the left to it has worms. What you see on the topmost is also a worm. So sometimes, you know, doing an endoscopy is very useful, especially when you've already done your non-invasive tests. Non-invasive tests would mean your fecal test, for example. You've done your blood test, you've done ultrasound, x-ray and other things. You're not able to diagnose anything. So the next step is to do endoscopy. Further, nothing is, uh, not, you can't find anything to an next lab, exploratory laparotomy and take some biopsy samples. There is no way that a patient has diarrhea without any rhyme or reason. There has to be a diagnosis. There has to be a reason for the diarrhea, right? So till the time you don't find the reason in chronic diarrhea, you cannot treat it. You just can't treat it. This is uh, some not so interesting thing. Uh, when we were in college, we used to run, at least I used to run away from, from the parasitology classes. But uh, in clinical practice, we realized how important how important these techniques are. So the first picture which you see is fecal flotation method, which we have discussed. Uh, and it's showing T cati and, and ankylostoma, so toxophora and ankylostoma. The one which is thick walled is the toxocera. The one which is thin walled and not uh, very dark in color is the ankylostoma. In the second picture, this is a GMSA stained fecal matter showing giardiasis. So GRDR trophozoites, very common, very, very common if you find them. The third one, uh, the bluish colored, blue and purple colored uh, slide picture that you see, this is this is of a, another stain. It is a modified uh, Zin Nielsen staining. This is a little more advanced staining. And what you see is the cryptosporidium. So I have also put in some pictures of the endoscopic views, but uh, Another thing which you know we commonly see, not so commonly actually, but we do see seldom is exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, which is a result of chronic pancreatitis. So the patient starts to have pancreatitis. That is the first step. In chronic cases of pancreatitis, when it is left untreated, undiagnosed, it becomes an EPI, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. The main clinical sign is weight loss. The cat has voracious appetite by this time. It has indigestion, maldigestion, malabsorption, malabsor and dysbosis. It is uncommon to see some, some of these pretty severe bacterial overgrowth by EPI. In cats, the chief underlying cause of EPI is chronic pancreatitis. So chronic pancreatitis leads to exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Chronic pancreatitis, inflammation, chronic inflammation of the pancreas will lead to lack of production of certain pancreatic enzymes which leads to indigestion which leads to weight loss which leads to diarrhea right this is less in cats than in dogs in dogs it's more common but we see this in cats as well so also because of this chronic pancreatitis and exocrine pancreatic insufficiency there is generally a lot of gastric reflux in the initial stages in the case in the stages of pancreatitis and the first pictures that you see is is the picture of esophagus, the food pipe. And we typically in, uh, see some circular rings in them. And these cir circular rings are an indication of esophagitis. 
which is acid reflux, which causes esophagitis. The second pictures, which are marked A, B, and C, are pictures of the colon, or colon, which is the last portion of the intestine, which is connecting to the rectum, the last portion of the intestine, which has the stool. So these images have been taken after giving an enema, because otherwise all you see would be feces. So if it, the intestines are covered with feces uh, over here, because the, uh, this, this is the storage area for the stools. So inflammation of colon causes colitis. Colitis is a painful condition. It can be painful, not always painful, but it can be a painful condition. But it's definitely a very uncomfortable situation for the cat as well as for you. And as response, and this is responsible for half of all the cases of chronic diarrhea. So half of the chronic cases of diarrhea are a result of inflammation of the colon called colitis. While it's relatively common and easy to treat, feline colitis can lead to inflammatory bowel disease, commonly called as IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, which is a more serious condition than colitis because then it becomes an irreversible condition sometimes. Unlike acute diarrhea, which often is self-limiting and may be managed with symptomatic or supportive therapy, chronic diarrhea usually requires specific diagnosis and therapy, otherwise you can't treat it. So that's why today's lecture, which is on chronic diarrhea, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing a lot on diagnosis of the problem. Because in acute diarrhea, you've already tried few things. You've changed the food, you've done probiotics, you've done certain kinds of treatments, antibiotics, you've done run the uh, basic tests. Now it's become chronic. Chronic is difficult to treat. So diagnostics are very, very important. Finding the intestinal parasites in the feces of a kitten with diarrhea does not establish parasitism, but it is a cause of intestinal disease, right? Although many kittens show a partial or complete resolution of clinical signs after the administration of a broad spectrum anti-helminthic or a dewormer, we deworm the, uh, diarrhea cats routinely, even in the face of negative fecal flotation or a negative GRDR. You know, so like I said, if it's a negative thing, still deworming is important. So deworm the kitten. There are uh, some serological screening for feline leukemia virus, which is available, fortunately. And that is, I recommend there is a combination test of FIV and FELV. And we generally do that with, for kittens with chronic diarrhea that have not responded to antiparasitic or dietary therapy. So the first step is deworm. After deworming is uh, look at the food change, add probiotics. It's not helping, go in for diagnostics. The first line of defense in antibiotics generally for us is metronidazole and uh, it is not a broad very very broad spectrum antibiotic but it covers GRDI and it covers certain kinds of uh, an, uh, bacteria especially the anaerobes anaerobic bacteria which are very common causes of uh, you know uh, diarrhea and it alters possibly also alters the intestinal microflora dampening cell mediated immunity so it Clostridia, for example, so it will dampen Clostridia. So metronidazole is the first line of antibiotic that I would use. Dietary modification is the first step. It should be considered in cats that fail to respond to empirical antiparasitic therapy or metronidazole. Definitely you should. Sometimes some cats are very fussy that you change the food, they will not eat it. So in those cases, you will give your para, uh, probiotics first. You will give antiparasitic uh, and dewormers. You will do a metronidazole course. Still not effective, definitely change the food. Even if you start uh, feeding a 50% 50, 50 of food, food and 50% of gastrointestinal food gradually within a five, seven days period, shift to a gastrointestinal diet. And we generally always use a commercial feline intestinal diet. Uh, and I think they're very, very successful. The commercially available feline intestinal diets, they're very good. And uh, they have large amounts of fermentable fiber. And kittens that fail to improve on commercial diet can be fed a cooked, uh, you know, uh, chicken diet, um, boiled without carbohydrates for five to ten days to provide a highly digestible meal containing moderate amounts of fat. So, moderate amounts of fat, low fat, no carbs, without carbohydrates. So, boiled chicken, not the liver, just the chicken white 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 meat. In cases of diarrhea, I prefer to get single single novel protein source so don't add multiple protein sources don't give mutton also fish also chicken also 
stick to one kind of protein that's more important than whether you're giving chicken or fish is not so important i prefer chicken that's a personal thing but uh, stick to one kind of protein dietary fat restriction is not as important as in dogs but yes in cats also give a low fat diet don't give a high fat diet Okay, before we go on to the treatment options, I let me discuss the uh, little more on feline inflammatory bowel disease. So we said that you know colitis leads to feline inflammatory bowel disease, in which a cat's gastrointestinal tract becomes chronically irritated and inflamed. Common signs of feline IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, include vomiting, weight loss, diarrhea, bloody stools. lethargy decreased appetite generally these guys are anemic when you do the blood test their body temperature is lower than usual they look really frail and very very weak they their eyes are popping out there is fat loss on the temporal fossas making a diagnosis of feline ibd requires an extensive workup now this extensive workup means multiple tests multiple tests a lot of testing to rule out other factors and then you narrow down and you eliminate other causes and then you Uh, recognize that it's IBD. Feline inflammatory bowel disease is a condition in which cat's gastrointestinal tract becomes chronically irritated and inflamed. So, what happens is inflammatory cells infiltrate the walls of the GI tract, thickening them and disrupting them, the, uh, disrupting the ability of the GI tract, the gastrointestinal tract, to properly digest and absorb food. Cats of any age can be affected by IBD. Kittens as well as young cats as well as old cats. But the disease occurs more commonly or most commonly in the middle aged. or older cats while the causes of ibd is unknown uh, currently but chronic colitis is one of the most common causes also there are complex abnormal interaction between the immune system sometimes it's autoimmune uh, sometimes it's diet related sometimes it's overgrowth of bacteria in the intestines and other environmental factors based upon similarities to ibd in people and dogs there are the, the treatment is very similar in humans as well as in in in, in cats uh there is something called uh, lymphocytic plasmocytic enteritis which is which is uh, which involves inflammatory lymphocytes and plasma cells which invade the small intestines and eosinophils are another type of inflammatory white blood cell which commonly involved in ibd so thereby when you start giving low dose steroids or antihistamines you know anti allergics the cat starts improving so it's more like a uh more like a disease which is uh, where the body's immune system is attacking its own intestinal tract and uh, thereby producing certain kinds of cells so when you give steroids when you give antihistamines these uh, cell go down in number and there is an improvement the, the there is a resolution of the signs also then sometimes there is a granulomatous ibd which is which is which involves macrophages uh, which is another kind of cells now this is typically seen in certain kinds of tumors and cancers also lymphomas i have some case studies which i'm going to show and share with you and uh, then there are certain uh, ibd sometimes we see in hormonal disturbances we see in uh, uh, ibd is like i said ibd is a chronic form of colitis or a chronic form of some other disease so once you reach this stage it's difficult to come back but you know uh, hyperthyroidism can cause IB, uh, ibd intestinal lymphoma can cause it there are certain kinds of viruses which can cause it um vitamin b12 or folate uh, has to be checked um so there are multiple reasons which can cause ibd we'll go up, go on to the treatment options and then we'll go on to the case studies and that will bring some more in, uh, that will enlighten you even further when when we talk about treatment option now treatment options are multi- there are multiple drugs used in treatment of gastrointestinal tract infections parenteral palmoid or fenbendazole are usually effective treatments for helminth which is basically a deworm parenteral palmoid and fenbendazole or fenbendazole and uh, some people end up using albendazole which is a human one uh, it does not work on everything so kindly don't use the human version of deworm use use the uh, cat deworm which is uh, parenteral palmoid or fenbendazole for giardia or uh, um, like a tritagonomonas or giardia is more common so let's talk about giardia they respond very well to metronidazole 
metronidazole is uh, fantastic for not just giardia but other anaerobic infections as well fenbendazole has recently shown to be effect ineffective for the treatment of giardia earlier it was meant to be used in giardia patients also but fenbendazole is used as an anti helminthic and not really for giardia you have to use metronidazole there if it is unknown then albendazole can be used but it can cause hematological toxicity so the human deworm albendazole i'm saying that kindly don't use it because it can cause an allergic reaction it can cause toxicity and it is also ineffective for most of the anti helminths which are present especially the baby baby the, la the larvas the larval stage of uh, tapeworm for example is ineffective there is uh, then there are causes like fibrosarcomas and you know like some cancers where uh, certain kind of therapies or uh, uh, certain kinds of chemotherapy or steroid use is recommended then there is sequential administration of clindamycin followed by tylosin which blocks certain kinds of oocyst shedding and also takes care of bacterial overgrowth so my second line of defense would be tylosin and clindamycin or a cephalosporin cephalosporin is ceftriaxone the generally the first generation plain ceftri uh, uh, all cephalosporins ceftriaxone is easily available the cheapest one of the cheapest and uh, antibiotic available with the veterinarian so as veterinarian i think my first line of defense is metronidazole second if i have to go on to a cephalosporin that would be my second line of defense third would be based on my culture and other results but i might add a clindamycin or a tylosin so in some cases we add an enrofloxacin depending on you know what what kind of a bacterial growth we see so from here we also think about now adding probiotics which is the good bacteria which helps in absorption metabolism and formation of good quality stools lastly in a lot of viral diseases uh, there is plasma or serum therapy available which is generally administered at 1 ml per kg from a hyper immune blood donor cat so a hyper immune a cat who has been vaccinated who has good levels of antibodies in the body for a particular kind of a um, virus typically what we use it for in our practice is feline pan leukopenia so for pan leukopenia cases what we do is that we take a little blood sample from a cat who's already recovered from pan leukopenia or the one who's been vaccinated and has a good immune response typically hyper immune response and then we spin it we separate the plasma or serum and then we after cross matching we can inject it into the cat typically reactions with a plasma are minimal so if you don't have cross matching available you can still use plasma if there are red blood cells present sometimes in the serum there are some amount of erythrocytes which stay then kindly don't don't infuse without doing a cross matching the uh, administration is 1 ml per kilogram body weight now here actually i wanted to gradually uh, uh, you know run, run across this there are two patients uh, two uh, case studies that i want to share and here i wanted to ask you questions also so i don't know how we going to do this can we uh, sakip is it possible to now start the chat session also because the, there are two case studies and i want some interaction on this Yes, sir. Uh, would you like to keep your PPT on or K two? Uh... I'm going to tell you that K two is a had a six when it came to us. It had a six month uh, history of watery to soft bowel diarrhea and progressive weight loss. K uh, two okay. was an old cat, is an uh, old cat, fourteen year old female, spayed Persian cat, and had six months history of watery to soft bowel diarrhea and progressive weight loss. this cat was so now as a veterinarian let's talk about what are the uh, what what did i'll just tell you what we did for this cat so the first step is to take history to gather the history so when i say 14 year old female spayed persian cat so i think about what is the breed of the cat how old it is what are the problems that i might see in a 14 year old spayed female cat 
and then i ask the i'll ask the owners what uh, for how long it has has the diarrhea been so it's a six month old history of watery to soft bowel diarrhea so it's giving me the consistency of their diarrhea it is watery to soft bowel diarrhea and progressive weight loss which means that the nutrients are not being absorbed the patient is constantly losing weight it's losing nutrients and losing electrolytes what whether this cat was indoor or outdoor the owner said that this was an indoor outdoor cat so it had access to the outdoor also it would stay indoors primarily but would also go out so this gives us a little information of what can the cat catch from outside for example maybe maybe the ones who go out more often will be more prone to catching intestinal worms right it was otherwise active and her appetite was good um i remember that the body condition score was about 3 to 9 3 on 9 which is very poor you could count the ribs by just you know running your fingers she was so thin and uh, there was mu multiple muscle wasting so you could actually just feel all the bones for example the thigh bones the hubris all the bones the spine could be felt so she was really really there was a lot of muscle wasting and the coat was also unkept so uh, the the hair the quality of the fur had really gone down because of lack of nutrition on the abdominal palpation the intestines felt very ropey so which means that the intestines were also feeling as if they were dehydrated and her abdominal would tense as i would uh, examine the abdomen so the abdomen would tense so she had some pain because of inflammation so dehydrated and inflamed intestines is what she had when i was palpating that's what i felt so we uh, the first step what's the first step we took a fecal sample the fecal sample was negative there was no the, we didn't get any constructive information from the fecal sample it was negative for any intestinal bones or there was no occult blood in it there was no information that we gathered so we also collected a blood sample and a urine sample so the blood sample we collected for liver function kidney function cbc and we did a routine urine test and we also checked the thyroxin levels here here there was a mild non regenerative anemia possibly because of lack of nutrition over the last 6 months but otherwise everything was normal the thyroid thyroid levels were normal the liver function was normal the kidney function was normal the urine test was normal the stool test was normal so everything was coming out normal but the cat clearly had been losing weight and for 6 months had diarrhea what this cat was eating well by the way the cat was eating so the next what do we do so the next we uh, we thought that you know uh, let's do a fpl which is the I, we use idex uh, machine for this and we also have a v check uh, so we did the specific the feline specific pancreatic lipase and that was somewhere in the gray zone which me meant that it had mild pancreatitis now when there is mild pancreatitis it could be also a result of chronic diarrhea because the nature of the disease was chronic now so sometimes there there is a mild pancreatitis we also checked the folate level which was normal and her vitamin b12 cobalamin levels they were low suggesting infiltrative small bowel disease with intestinal malabsorption right so now the only test results which indicated something were slightly elevated feline pancreatic lipase number 1 number 2 low cobalamin levels which was indicating small bowel disease small intestinal diarrhea with intestinal malabsorption leading to emaciation and chronic diarrhea the i remember the abdominal ultrasound that revealed hypertrophic small intestines inflamed really badly inflamed small intestines and and more importantly diffuse thickening of the muscles of the intestines this is very prominent uh, uh, this very prominent thickening of the muscularis layer of the intestines stand out in cats with prominent gi disease and the primary diagnostic differentials now were ibd inflammatory bowel disease and gastrointestinal small cell lymphoma with idiopathic chronic pancreatitis so now we have narrowed down to three things that either we have we have a case of inflammatory bowel disease or we have a case of uh, small cell lymphoma which is a cancer or we have a uh, uh, idiopathic enteritis chronic uh, because of chronic pancreatitis right so now the next step which was uh, 
a more invasive and uh, this is performed under anesthesia was the endoscopy so we performed an endoscopy and we took some biopsy samples of the intestinal mucosa which was inflamed and gelatinous so the histopathology uh, results came in after five days which showed massive lymphocyte infl infiltration and diffuse small cell lymphoma so cancer lymphoma is a cancer and that that is what was diagnosed in the histopathology result from the biopsy sample that we had taken so after first few weeks of treatment which included steroids corticosteroids metronidazole certain kind of uh, chemotherapy called um, so we we consult a regular oncologist for most of our onco patients and uh, chlorambucil was used with vitamin b12 because the b12 levels the cobalamin levels were low and the ketose diarrhea began to resolve and the weight also started to improve and she did live for a few years on the uh, chemotherapy protocol but eventually then we lost her um, i think she we lost her last year but it was a nice case it was a very chronic case all the test results were coming out negative it was a nice case to diagnose and eventually treat and the next few years of ketu's life because of a good diagnosis went well so uh, that's why you know again saying that you know it's important to diagnose the condition very very important there is one more case and then we'll end our lecture the next case is that of julie julie uh, and we'll quickly run through this came in uh, julie was a 10.5 year old when it came to us it was a 10.5 year old female cat spayed cat this was uh, not really a breed it was uh, like an indie cat but a beautiful looking indie cat that someone had adopted uh, from the hills somewhere and uh, it had a 5 6 months history of diarrhea some vomiting inappetence weight loss on physical examination again you know it was a similar thing that there was muscle wasting there was uh, you know bad fur condition there was some patchy alopecia in certain areas there was mild pain on chronic uh, cranial abdomen so mild pain on palpation of the cranial abdomen cranial abdomen is towards the rib cage her cbc the blood test the cbc and the thyroid levels were normal her Uh, amino transferase uh, alanine amino transferase was mildly elevated the urine analysis showed epithelial cells and white blood cells which mean some infection in the urine her specific uh, feline specific pancreatic lipase was normal her folate levels were high sometimes this is seen with uh, dys dysbiosis and her cobalamin levels which were the vitamin b12 levels were low in the previous case the folate levels were okay here the folate levels are coming high and the cobalamin is coming low abdominal ultrasound revealed prominent mesenteric lymph nodes which means that lymph nodes were prominent and slightly enlarged mildly thickened intestines which means inflammation of the muscularis layer and large bladder stone but large bladder stone possibly was the reason for or a result of the uh, infection of the urine but our uh, this was an accidental finding our case was that of uh, chronic diarrhea so we created differential diagnosis list of again you know uh, similar kind of things which is ibd inflammatory bowel disease uh, gi small cell lymphoma and thirdly exocrine pancreatic insufficiency exocrine pancreatic insufficiency has a test called tli test which is not available in india so we go by the physical sign and we rule out other things and based on that we we will diagnose this condition so now we decided that let's remove the bladder stone anyways we have to remove the bladder stone so let's remove the bladder stone take care of the infection and at the same time we will also probe the pancreas and other things so we went in for the surgery we removed the bladder stone and the pancreas were observed to be shrunken and the bowel was thickened the pancreas were really shrunken which indicated and helped us diagnose that maybe this is e epi because the pancreas was shrunken they were very tiny so maybe that because of chronic pancreatitis so maybe this is converted into an epi where there is lack of production of pancreatic enzymes thereby leading to lack of absorption malabsorption and diarrhea so but what we did was the uh, lymph nodes and the pancreas we took a biopsy again and It, uh, it the histopathology results which came back they came back as reactive lymph nodes moderate diffuse lymphoplasmocytic enteritis 
Now the diagnosis was made as mild to moderate IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, plus exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. EPI. Now EPI was based on improvement with pancreatic enzyme supplementation. So uh, just like reverse engineering. So when you start supplementing the patient with pancreatic enzymes and if the patient is improving, so the diagnosis of EPI is made. Now Julie was treated with pancreatic enzymes and we also started steroids with the steroid dose was tapered down and within a month she was off steroids and a course of cobalamin injections and also hypoallergenic diet uh, the feline hypoallergenic diet which is commercially available and she's still alive she's still there she's living a happy life and uh, now that's comes that brings us to the end of the lecture uh, thank you very much for listening i hope it wasn't too boring and i hope that none of you have fallen asleep and i hope that this was informative so uh, thank you and uh, don't let, uh, let just like the picture here don't let the diary or the feces smile at uh, smile at you and you becoming angry and the cat becoming anxious so treat the cause diagnose the problem treat the cause that's important critical and i'm going to stop sharing my screen we'll go back to the main screen Thank you, thank you, doctor. And uh, I'm sure nobody slept because uh, uh, when people come and listen on a Sunday evening, you must understand that you know how much they love their cats, and most importantly, how important this topic is. And um, I'm sure that when the team came up with your name, uh, they certainly had a lot of uh, expectations. And as always, you know, you always deliver a fantastic, fantastic session. And those two sessions, like you know, when you talked about Kitu. Um, she was already 14 years old, you know, 14 year old is like, let's say 80 year old human, if I'm not wrong. Yeah. And um, again, you know, treating the cat and at that age, you know, um, the response to medicine also goes down as if I'm not wrong. Yeah. And then making it, and it was suffering from cancer and making it live for two more years. It's like, you know, almost 100 years of age has completed. So that's a fantastic job. And I think, uh, um, that's how important the diagnosis is. Uh, before you joined and when you were having technical glitch, I was talking to our audience and saying that, you know, how difficult diagnosis in cats are. Uh, number yeah. one, they're animals, they cannot talk. That is common to all the better veterinarians. Plus, they hide their pain, you know. Um, evolution, okay. Evolutionary um, psychology as such or, or the evolution has helped them that, you know, to survive in wild, they have to hide their pain. So that, that, that makes even things uh, difficult for a doctor and uh, hats off to all the vets you know fighting their war over there and trying to understand what's wrong with the cat when, when you don't we don't have much of a scope to understand and with both the cases what we saw is you used the elimination elimination process you know it's not that you do a test and you come down to the conclusion right away so yeah. like you know in first case you jot down to three diseases and then you did biopsy and then made sure that it's a cancer uh, but you know that whole whole procedure, um, it's 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 all a lot of science and um, technology involved, and also your experience as a vet involved, and then it, it comes down to the conclusion. So you know, uh, summing down, the diagnosis is really important uh, when when you talk, and in time diagnosis is important is what I would say because uh, what what mistakes our cat owners do is they will not take their cat to the vet immediately when the problem is surfaced. And then it doesn't give even with a scope that, you know, they can go down to the problem. And, you know, in that process only, the cat will lose its life. So I think it's 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 the bond between the cat owner and the vet that would help the cats to live more or, you know, a healthy life. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that's the objective of FCI that, you know, when we do sessions like this, collaborating uh, with Troitis and other people, that, you know, uh, we should, we have to empower the veterinary science. And um, try and go for you know regular checkups as 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 much as possible because the third angle view for cats is very important. Uh, thank you, thank you, doctor. You know it was a fantastic, fantastic session. Uh, there are a few questions, and uh, before going to the questions, you know I would just like to say that I would just like to ask you that you know in in, in such acute problem, you know the chronic problem, how does because we are get we are having so many uh, prescription diets, you know. Uh, for digestive care and all those sort of things. Uh, how important are these um, uh, the, these prescribed food uh, or prescribed uh, diet when it comes to you know, handling this, this sort of problems? 
you know, you'll be surprised. So a lot of people would say that, you know, there was no cat food available in the market in India, at least for in the last, you know, it's just come in in the last 20 years and yeah. our cats were happy on milk or they were happy on, uh, you know, just home based diet. Uh, right. But it's, it's such a myth. It's su- such a wrong thing to do. See, cats are carnivorous animals. They are, uh, they are obligate carnivores. Obligate carnivores. Yeah. So cats need a certain kind of diet. And when we start mixing our cat diet with home food, so we are creating some kind of imbalance, right? In our country, it's also difficult to procure good quality, healthy meat. So if you want to feed raw meat to your your cat, which is absolutely fine, you can do that. But you have to ensure that you're procuring the meat from a, from a butcher's uh, a shop or, you know, you're procuring it from a place where hygiene is maintained and you know that the animal wasn't sick. If the animal was sick, and if you're feeding that sick animal to your cat, mm-hmm. then you know your, your cat is going to fall sick. So that's why cooking becomes an important part of of Indian uh, in in Indian feeding. Number one. Number two. I also uh, feel that you know it's very difficult to very very difficult to sort of decide that one diet is good for all cats. So let's say you know dry food, wet food, home food. So three things, combination of three. How to balance it? Now, how to balance it is a very, very complex question because every cat, every breed and every cat and that to a different stages of its life. Let's say a cat who's pregnant, a cat who's lactating, a cat who's a tomcat, a cat who's a kitten, an old cat. So they all have different requirements. So I think, you know, uh, commercially available foods make our lives very, very easy. You know, they typically make our lives so easy that there is a food for every uh, for different stages of life there is a food which is available for different types of conditions and disease processes and there is a lot of research and development which has already gone into it so might as well you know take that food and use it and i'm telling you 50 percent of the problems are resolved with just proper nutrition nutrition yeah. and one very important thing that uh, uh, dr kunal mentioned i would like to repeat that that uh, diarrhea is not a disease diarrhea is a symptom or uh, diarrhea is an outcome of a disease where the underlying problem is different. So um, a lot of people will go for, you know, generic antibiotics, or, you know, um, all those sort of things, uh, uh, you know, uh, pushing abundance of prebiotics and probiotics immediately when uh, the cat is falling sick or, you know, when, when there is uh, diarrhea. So what would you say, doctor, you know, how important it is to go to the root of the problem? As you also mentioned that there is a chance that you know when 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 there is corona or you can go to FIP stage also. So it could be deadly, you know. It could be really deadly and go an irreversible stage where uh, there is no coming back. So, so you know, early diagnosis. You know, can you can you comment or you know what should be the process? Because I'm sure that you know in your clinical practice, so many things, so many patients would have come out. You would have think in your mind that you know maybe this patient came uh, should have came two weeks earlier or you know three weeks earlier and then the situation would have been better so what would you recommend to cat owners that you know how they should treat this mm-hmm. and how important it is to be alert on what is happening to them? see there are certain questions which you have to ask yourself uh, if the diarrhea is happening in only one cat if it's a multi-cat household or if it's happening in multiple cats so that kind of differentiate whether some there is a pathology happening in one particular cat or if there is an infection which is going on, then it will be multiple cats, right? Yeah. So that is the first step. Second thing is to uh, figure out if it is, what is the age of the patient? Is it a kitten or is it an adult? What is the deworming status? What is the vaccination status, right? Okay. And if there is a recent change in diet, there are some cats who eat more. In fact, you know, who will go to the other cat's bowl also and eat food. So that can lead to indigestion. Some cats have the habit of not drinking water Cats don't like uh, drink a lot of water anyways, but some cats don't like to drink water from the bowl. They would like to go to the bathroom and drink it, drink dirty water. So those cats will be more prone to catching infections. Or, or, so or knowing your water. cat, sorry? Or flowing water from the tap. Or flowing, flowing water from the tap. They would like to, you know, the water should open the correct, tap. Correct. Yes, yes. So knowing your cat is very important. And see, your veterinarian does not know your cat as well as you do, right? So you have to know your cat and you have to provide this information to, to the veterinarian. The first step when there is diarrhea, you or vomits or indigestion or the cat is lethargic. So you look at these factors. Then you look at the body temperature of the patient. You see if there is 
the cat's activity level is good or bad. If the cat's activity level is also going down, there is definitely something wrong happening. Must rush to the veterinarian, get some testing done. If the cat's activity level is okay, there was a recent change in the diet, probably switch over to a gastrointestinal meal, add probiotics, add a gripe water or a digestive tonic to it, and see if it resolves in 24 hours. Not resolving, or if it's a kitten who's not vaccinated and not deworms, get the fecal test done at least. Get the stool test done, at least get a CBC done. CBC is a small blood test, very, very quick, very cheap. And a fecal test, a stool test, very, very cheap, very, very quick. Based on that, at least you will know if there is a virus which is infecting, if there is a bacteria, there is a virus, or there are uh, there are uh, worms which are affecting the cat. Based on that, you can prevent a, a bigger problem later on. So your first steps when you are catching the infection in the acute stage is knowing your cat, looking at the history, asking yourself the questions, looking around in the house, is there paint renovation going on? Did you use uh, rat poison in the house? Did you use something which might be toxic to cats? Did you bring in a plant or flowers which may, may the cat has consumed? Things like those. And then some basic tests, your stool test and a CBC. It's a must. It's a very, very simple way of diagnosing small little things. One, one very important inference I would like to derive from uh, your answer to this question, Dr. Kunal, is uh, there was a very uh, beautiful statement which I read a few years ago that, you know, you should never send your cat to the vet. You know, you should take your cat to the vet. So there is a difference when, you know, when the owner is taking the cat to the vet, he can answer these questions to the vet, not your driver, not your servant, or not your uncle yeah. and auntie who is just passing by. So uh, that's something very important that, you know, this healthy discussion between a vet and a cat owner is very important. And that's the only thing where the vet can derive the meaningful things uh, and use them into the diagnosis or analyzing the problem uh, altogether. Um, yeah. Beautifully explained, Dr. Kunal. You know, can we can we please go to the question and answer because there are sure, uh, absolutely questions. You know, uh, so Mr. Adil, uh, he asked that what is the good pre-probiotic supplement for a cat that has prolonged bad gut? So, you know, uh, there are multiple prebiotics and probiotics available. Anything which is and there are about ten different formulations in the market. And uh, out of these ten different formulations, it really depends what is available near your house. Uh, or uh, you know close to the area that you are in there are some imported ones there are some indian ones and there is a huge disparity in the uh, price of these products uh, the imported ones typically are more expensive and they are uh, they generally come in this paste form um, i can name a few maybe like pro colon or diagen uh, which are imported ones then there are uh, in, uh, the indian ones which are uh, pogest gutwell and then there are some human ones which are also effective because they carry some bacteria. So they may not be 100% veterinary based, but they can be used because those are also good bacteria. So something like an enterogermina, 1BC uh, can be used. So there are multiple kinds. Don't go by, you know, what, which one is the best because the best ones may not be available. But I think, you know, using any, any probiotic. So probiotic, I'll tell you, that will be probiotic even now uh, in the world is actually taking over with a huge, there is a tsunami wave of probiotics. Because it improves the immune system overall. It not just improves the gut, the gut health, the intestinal health when it's good. It improves the immunity overall. So using a probiotic off and on or, you know, whenever uh, periodically or in using it as a pulse therapy is a very good idea. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Uh, Alia Patel, she has a question. It's like, I have a six months uh, kitten and he is having diarrhea for past two months. And I have given him all medicines, but not healthy. Well, I would say that, you know, you must uh, get uh, go to your veterinarian. And like we've discussed in this lecture, um, if you've made some notes, uh, ask your veterinarian to run some tests. Uh, the basic tests, like I said, uh, would be to take a blood sample, to also take a stool sample. So do a stool test, a routine stool test, also culture of the stools. So those two tests you'll be doing from the stools, then with the blood, rule out the liver involvement, kidney involvement, and check the thyroid levels, and also perform a CBC. Same blood sample can be also used. See, now it's a two-month-old disease. So generally, panleukopenia, panleukopenia would have killed the kitten by now, right? Yeah. So, but it might be converting into an IBD, it might be converting into a colitis. So for those things, you also need to further go on to uh, 
an x-ray of the abdomen or an ultrasound or both and with with kittens we generally it, it is not we don't see with kittens ibd or colitis very easily because those are chronic diseases that we generally see in older cats or cats who are young adults but not in kittens so here i think you know your steps are to first diagnose the problem by ruling out certain diseases so do a blood test do the stool test do an ultrasound of the abdomen and change the diet if you've not changed to a gastrointestinal diet change the diet to a gastrointestinal diet if things are still not resolving then you go in for uh, for a clonoscopy and take some samples for an endoscopy and take some samples from inside and uh, it could be it could be one of those infections which have not responded to the medicines that you have taken given because generally like i'll give you an example like helicobacter infection helicobacter we use uh, uh, azithromycin but azithromycin is not a generally used antibiotic in cats i would not use it unless there is a you know a helicobacter infection i won't use it so some of the antibiotics that we use may not be covering the infection which is there and unless you run some tests you won't know that's what i told you sir you know that, that uh, the uh, people tend to go for uh, general broad spectrum antibiotics and then they don't get results and maybe they will switch to one two three uh, different types of uh, broad spectrum antibiotic and like you discussed that you know they forget to use azithromycin so or they don't know that they have to use azithromycin so yeah i mean one wouldn't yeah. use without yeah. without a diagnosing a diagnosing a condition so diagnosis don't don't jump to treatment treatment is secondary treatment google will give you but you <laughs> jump to diagnosis honestly you get all treatments you can get on uh, on google but diagnose the condition yeah that, uh, that, that's, that's one of the very important questions sir that you know what is the, the best treatment for diarrhea in newborn kittens like few days old um, yeah so that's so, one of the reason for losing kittens early stage correct correct so see what uh, you remember we had uh, the definition of diarrhea the definition of diarrhea when we said so i said that we what does it cause it causes loss, loss of, of electrolytes fluid, water electrolytes and nutrients right so as a result what happens is that the kitten goes into dehydration mm -hmm. goes into electrolyte imbalance goes into loss of nutrition thereby causing hypoglycemia right the glucose levels drop so what you have to take care is you have to take care of the electrolytes sodium potassium chloride so you can use ors mixed with ors mixed with the feed supplement you can use uh, then the ne next thing is uh, you need some amount of glucose going in otherwise the patient goes into uh, hypoglycemia there is a product called oralate which we use a lot i don't know if you've seen it or heard of it it's uh, it's an electrolyte mixture which is for dog and cats and it works beautifully because it has the right ingredients it has oralate has uh, uh, not just electrolytes not just glucose but it also leads it uh, the osmosis is such that it's an isotonic solution so just like in uh, southeast asian countries in malaysia singapore you get these isotonic drinks even in india we get isotonic drinks which you know after workout uh, a plain water that we plain water that we consume does not get absorbed so quickly whereas these drinks get absorbed very quickly so oralate is like that then you have to go to the root cause again see the kittens who are developing diarrhea either will be because of the milk that you are giving either it could be the mother's milk which is infected or it could be the replacement milk which is not good or or else there has to be an infection if there is an infection then it could be it could be a viral or a bacterial infection very seldom we end up giving back, uh, antibiotics to kittens because most of these kittens respond very well to dietary changes electrolytes height uh, good hydration level and probiotics most of the kittens will respond to that very few kittens will will have an infectious reason will have a viral disease or a bacterial disease so then you have to go back to the history of the mother also that is the was the mother suffering from some disease fiv or flv because that can get transmitted right or fip for that matter that can get transmitted and that causes ferine enteric coronavirus in the kitten so then you have to use the plasma or serum of a hyperimmune hyperimmune cat and that's the only thing that works generally in newborn uh, newborn kittens maintaining the temperature is another very important factor because the moment uh, they have diarrhea their body temperature starts to dip so don't overheat but maintain the temperature make an incubator make sure to incubate 
so using a carton with some um, you know hay or uh, cotton inside putting some hot water bottles around it and using a 100 uh, watt bulb which is not very very close don't use a heater i don't like using heaters because it causes more dehydration so make an incub incubator which also if you can uh, you can also add a, a small bowl of water you know nearby so that it keeps on uh, the environment is not dehydrated it's not causing further dehydration to the body yeah thank you thank you sir and um... um the reason why i'm taking this question is you know it's to do with the care of newborn kittens but um when when the the, the question says and has you know the elaborate the advantage and disadvantage advantage of cow milk or skim milk powder and that's something that uh, you discussed in the beginning of the q and a session that you know um about uh, obligatory carnivore and lactose intolerant and all those kind of things and the management of diarrhea in very young kitten uh, who has been orphaned okay so there is no availability of the mother uh, and if i am mean asked that what can be an alternative to cholesterol milk for kittens um, and he thanks you in advance so that's the uh, question i think i think this particular question sakeb you have a lot of experience to answer this one and you you'll answer this better than me so so, uh, so basically as you said that you know there is no uh, a way where we can feed uh, cow milk or skim milk because it's Absolutely. it's lactose intolerant but you have a lot of uh, um uh, you know the milk replacements so like you right. have uh, in 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 uh, pet pet ig pharma which makes you know kmr stage 1 kmr stage 2 so where they are uh, rich into cholesterol and uh, for an orphanage kittens you know the basic thing that we go through is you know you have to take the weight of the kitten as simple as that um the the, the stomach capacity and now it's orphan so there is no uh, availability of uh, mother uh, near, near the kitten so it's like it has to right. be completely on the artificial uh, milk uh, so the capacity of the body is 2 ml per, per 50 g of body weight so if the body weight of the kitten is 100 g you have to feed them 4 ml per feeding okay and you have to repeat this 7 to 8 times a day so it's like you know 7 to 8 times a day and uh, every time before you feed because uh, uh, mother nature has so beautifully designed kittens that you know they will not secrete urine or poop uh before uh, you know unless and until their mother licks the genital areas so what you should do is you know before you start uh, giving them the food of the next uh, uh, time you have to take a cotton and gently rub the genital areas you know gently means really gentle so that you know they will start to poop and uh, urinate there is also a myth doc if you know that you know people say that the cats the uh, kittens will not urinate or poop till they are one month old okay mm-hmm. it's not like that it's basically the mother will uh, uh, wash it off and you know that's that's how uh, god has created uh, this this beautiful animal so you have to do that otherwise you will stop you will put stuffing in the milk and there is no excretion happening and that can also put a lot of pressure on the bladder of the kitten also uh, sir, it, have you experienced uh, uh, there are uh, i remember when I, i used to work in england and there were uh, uh, certain breeders who would you know as a milk replacer they would not use the commercially available ones which i failed to understand why but uh, and they would use goat milk mixed goat with milk. egg yolk and gelatin and you know or corn starch uh, so uh, have you and and uh, and yogurt as a milk replacer have have you heard of that or used yeah, it well, i'll i'll tell you i'll tell you one experience of mine you know uh, where you know there was this uh, big litter of uh, uh main coons that happened at my place and there were eight kittens and uh, the mom was uh, uh, suffering with acute infection you know the, the the milk was completely sour and the ph level was um, almost 6 you know 6 between 5.5 6 it was really acidic so this is what we do you know we we, we do the uh, ph test at the uh, mm. the time the kitten is being born or before they are born and be prepared you know that something is going to be wrong and this commercial kmr or uh, uh, pet lack was not available in the market it was not available in in the market already the importer couldn't get them you know this was during the mm-hmm. lockdown one right. so what we used to do is we used we 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 went to you know a slum uh, close by where there was a goat uh, so this female goat we used to go wash the uh, goat thoroughly uh, sanitize it and then mm-hmm. take uh, milk and immediately after the milk was taken we would put some uh, water then go uh, to our house and with the same pattern you know 
um, two ml per 50 gram, uh, 50 gram of body weight is what we did. And the people in the surrounding used to think that who is this uh, guy or is he doing some spell on the goat, you know, <laughs> that, why, why is he washing it thoroughly every time he is going and skimming it off. And, you know, I used to, used to, used to uh, take the milk out myself uh, for the goat. So, yes, and, and luckily the kitten survived, you know, the uh, till 20, 25 days, we were getting good 12 to, it said that, you know, the first, first month you should get 40, 14 grams, one four, 14 grams yeah. of uh, growth every day, which is considered to be really good. Uh, but we were getting around 10, 12-ish, something like that. And then we started putting feed in their mouth at early stage. And luckily, all eight of them survived, you know. Oh, wow. So it was a big win-win for us. And, you know, it was like something we improvised, tried out, uh, you know, talking to our uh, fellow uh, cat owners abroad. And this is the result that we got. So, yes, it happens, but I'll tell you, it's a pain, you know, you have to, there it's are so pain. many, yeah, yeah. Know, so you, many it's very difficult to get it right. And you get yeah. it slightly wrong, you can lose the life. Yeah, sir. And sanitization is, you know, the cleanliness, I think it is the most important part over very here. Important. Because uh, they are not using litter trays. The goats are not lit using litter trays. They would be tied the whole day there. They are pooping yeah. and urinating and they are sitting there only. Okay. Right. And so, so and, and, and the basic, you know, the, the breast of the um, goat is exposed below and every time she sits yeah. she's getting the infection out and yeah. so that was the biggest problem you know to clean it thoroughly before you get the milk out and then the initial stage of milk we used to take you know 5 10 ml and we should just throw it off and mm. then the next so there, yeah. there are a lot of do and uh, do's and don'ts and you know uh, like like a good student what the person told me i just followed it but to follow in our condition it's it's a dangerous uh, situation it's not easy. so it's yeah easy. it was it was an it was an experience that uh, we took and uh, Luckily, we managed to save all of them, and they are now healthy kittens, uh, healthy adults at the moment. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, um, uh, sir. Uh, there, there are a few more questions. I think quickly we'll uh, do. Is um, a good question from Adil that when, while kitten or a cat is passing watery stool, is it safe to deworm the cat at yeah, that time? It's safe. It's safe, right? Yeah. yeah. Because it might be uh, the the worms might be the cause for the watery stools. Right. And there are a lot of questions, sir. That you know, I have seven months old, two years old, prolonged. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, if you can send me uh, uh, an email, I can have a brief reply sent sent back to you. Right, right. No, no. They are like you know similar questions. Uh, okay. The same questions asked by multiple people that yeah, they have prolonged prolonged things. So I think what you said is very important that you can do. Uh, two tests, one, you know, a stool sample and CBC. Yeah. Uh, and then the doctors have heads up for that and yeah. use appropriate medicines to get yeah. uh, in the middle, in the, in the bottom of the problem. And very rightly said, uh, vets are, the, the skill set of vets is for diagnosis. Uh, <laughs> treatment, you can get it. Yeah, that's the backbone. You know? So uh, if you know the problem, I think anybody can uh, use, you know, the percentage of the medicine to be given it's important. That's where the beauty of vets comes in. You know, it's 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 a really tedious job, and I think I'm I'm happy that you are doing the uh, hard part for us. <laughs> I think it's it's one uh, one big family. Everyone is doing the bit. Right, sir. Right, sir. So thank you, thank you, Dr. Kunal. It's always wonderful, you know, interacting with you, and you know, the amount of uh, um, cats that you have in OPD is also. Uh, the example, uh, it, it's also the reason for your experience with uh, cats and uh, we wish you all the best and uh, all you. the best to Thank you so and, much. Thank uh, you for thank, having, having me over. Yes, and we would like, also like to thank Zoetis who has been our partners and you know, they have always been our health partners uh, whenever uh, we are doing any outdoor events. So that's great to have uh, collaborations all together and uh, I would again like to thank uh, Dr. Kunal to you from all the cat family. That, you know, your session will be there on YouTube and Facebook uh, forever. So anybody who has problem, they are sure. But you know, by listening to this one, one, one and a half uh, hours of session, they can uh, at least understand the roadmap. You know, if not the problem, that you know what, how how you should uh, treat this problem and what are the best practices that one should follow when you are uh, dealing with this problem. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a uh, good Sunday, whatever is left of it. Have a, have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Sir. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Be safe.